Hello everyone and happy International Women's Day. So I'm going to have a couple of uh, slides where I have tiny, tiny code on there, so I invite you to come forward. There are still plenty of seats in the front, but if not, it will be a throwback to your childhood where you sat on the floor and listened to stories of um, witches and dragons. Now, I can't offer witches and dragons, but I hope to show you some technological marvels that actually seem pretty magical. So with that, I want to tell you three stories. So the first one is about CSIRO, which is Australia's government research agency that I'm working at. The second one is around the technology that we use in order to find disease genes, so find out which genes actually cause certain diseases in humans. And that will be a Apache Spark application. And the third story is around how we use serverless architecture to really you know, build sustainable and cheap um, research workflows, particularly in the genome engineering space. So a little plug, the last one will be very short because tomorrow I'll have a longer session around serverless architecture in general, which will feature GT Scan, which is the technology, but I also have a couple of other cloud patterns that I want to talk to you about tomorrow. So with that, let's jump into what and who CSIRO is. So as I said, CSIRO is Australia's government research agency. They have about 6,000 or 5,000 staff. Most of them are PhDs, so research scientists, and um, we are in the top 1% of global research agencies. But I think what really makes us unique and special is that we're very passionate about translating research into products that people can use in their everyday lives. So what are one of the interesting or you know, most well-known products? Well, we invented Wi-Fi. So the fast modern Wi-Fi that you have in your devices is actually, or was actually invented by C0. Other areas are, for example, fluid treatment, as well as the polymer banknotes. So this is plastic money that you can, of course, use in order to go surfing, which is why it's you know, appropriate that it's coming out of Australia. So I am part of the eHealth Research Center, which is the largest digital health center in Australia, part of CSIRO, and our Wi-Fi equivalent technology that we invented is CardiHub. So CardiHub is a little mobile app that is used in cardi or heart rehabilitation. So once you had a stroke or another you know, adverse event in your life regarding your heart, you usually go into rehab. And you would think that having you know, a heart attack or something like that would actually convince you to change your lifestyle. Well, it turns out that it doesn't. So this little app has actually increased the uptake of rehabilitation and the completion rate of rehabilitation by 70%. So I would say this little app already has saved lives. So with that, my area is genomics, which is around variance work. So what is the genome? The genome holds the information of basically every cell in your body. So it holds the information how to build your skeletal muscle, or your skeletal system, your muscle system, heart, lung, brain, you name it. It's all encoded into a three billion letter long string. So as such, it's not surprising that it regulates many other things, not just the architecture of your body, but also how you look, what diseases you have, and what behaviors you exhibit. So I usually you know, do this little fun game where I ask people, if you look at your thumb, the last digit, how much it bends to the back, is actually regulated by genomics. And the thumb, and comparing the thumb between you and the person next to you, is actually quite surprising how far back some people can move the last digit. So where are the super movers of the last digit? There should be, so one in three actually in this room have a thumb that goes way back. So mine is pretty normal, but I can see some pretty impressive specimens down there. Similarly with coriander. So they are usually in a Caucasian audience, there are one in six coriander haters in the audience. But it turns out that in South Asia, which we're here, 
but these coriander haters are in the minority. So it's one in 12, actually. So are there any coriander haters in the room? One? <laughs> so all of this um, is obviously a fun application. But of course, there are other things encoded in the genome that are far more serious. So for example, genetic diseases. Cystic fibrosis has a change you know, at one position of one, you know, three billion letters. One letter is changed, and that results in a detrimental disease like cystic fibrosis. So therefore, it's quite an important thing to study and to understand how the architecture of the genome actually influences the risks and the rest of our lives. So with that, it's um, the question is how can we tease out three billion letters? How do we find the actual disease gene? And it's a pretty straightforward application in that you have um, your genome and every line here represents a person. You identify how that person is different to the person, you know, to another person. So between you and the person next to you, there are about two million differences in the genome. And these differences are these little tiny boxes that I showed here. And then you recruit your cases and your controls, so the people that are half the disease and the people that have healthy. And all you need to do is find the difference. Now, of course, this is oversimplified and the real world is a little bit more complicated, but I think for the, you know, for the purpose of this, this actually um, is sufficient to understand how disease genes are actually found in the genome. So it sounds easy, but when you take the scale of the genome and the scale that needs to be into this research into account, it becomes much harder. So this slide shows that genomic information is going to grow over the next, you know, by 2025, it's growing at a rate that is unprecedented. So the intake of genomic data will outpace traditional big data areas like astronomy, Twitter, and YouTube combined. So by 2025, it's estimated that there will be 20 exabytes per year of new data generated in that space, which is staggering and it scares me. <laughs> so, but it's actually necessary in order to find complex or the origin of complex diseases. So here the machine learning task you know, of finding which is the disease team needs to be done on 1.7 trillion data points. So for example, for the project MINE, which we collaborate with, which is an international consortium looking at the genetic origin of a motor neuron disease called ALS, which you might be familiar from Stephen Hawkins having that disease and the ice bucket challenge. So finding what is actually the under, underlying genetic cause of that disease requires 22,000 individuals to be analyzed. So 22,000, each one of them will have an average 2 million differences that equates to this 1.7 trillion data points, which is truly enormous. But luckily, you know, the big data industry and other fields have come along and, and helped us. So this is how I think about Hadoop and Spark. Going all the way back from desktop computers, which have one CPU on there that is nuclear. The next iteration in my mind was high-performance compute which has many of these CPUs, but all of them, you know, each CPU is basically distinct from the next one next to it. Whereas, which is a compute intensive task. So it's built for compute intensive tasks like methodology, you know, predictions that are truly independent of each other and just purely need to crunch the numbers. Whereas in genomics and specifically machine learning, we need to have iterative tasks. So every calculation depends on every other calculation, and it requires the full data set to be analyzed at the same time. So this is a truly data-intensive task. And for that, Spark or Hadoop Spark is actually um, the setup to do so. And the reason for that is that each CPU is not, in, uh, is not disconnected from the next CPU, but it's sort of the boundaries between the CPUs dissolve, which is sort of what I'm showing here in my little, um, in my little graphic. So therefore, we can build parallelization approaches that are much easier, and because of the standardization that Hadoop gives us, faster to implement in order to really crunch those large amounts of data. So with that, 
we develop VarianceSpark, which is basically a machine learning, a random forest application for big data. And our invention was sort of that we paralyzed it using really the, the for leveraging the benefits or the strengths of Spark. So with that, what you can do is you can do your standard machine learning classification. So given a new individual, we want to predict whether that individual will develop disease or is a healthy one. But also we want to know what are actually the disease, the disease genes that I said before. So identifying which gene causes the disease or in machine learning terms that is feature selection. How many of you actually um, are familiar with machine learning? Okay. Good. So nothing, nothing really special about it. As long as you understand, sort of, we want to find the disease genes, which are you know, one of three billion letters in the genome, and we want to know which ones are predictive. That is sort of the task that variance bug is trying to solve. So therefore, even though this is genomics, right, we're here in a business audience. Therefore, I thought I'm a little, you know, doing this little exercise of thinking which other discipline actually has this wide kind of data. So by wide, I mean, typically when you, when you talk about big data, you're talking about many samples, right? And each data point per sample is, say, the customer, age, location, sentiment, or something like that, right? Which is usually a small amount of features per sample. But here we're talking about the whole genome, which is per sample 80 million variances. So it's a couple of orders of magnitude larger than what traditional big data approaches are designed for. So therefore, rather than looking at disease status, you might want to predict the churn rate or the occurrence of failure or you know, a security attack. And rather than looking at genomic profiles, which are the mutations in your genome, you might want to look at time series, or concatenated data, or sensor data, or log files. Now with the datafication, basically, of everything, the data will become larger and larger and larger in that dimension, as well as this dimension. So therefore, the task is not, in your, in your world, disease gene prediction, but it might be general predictive markers. So which time point is actually most predictive with a cyber attack? or what kind of log file information is predictive of the occurrence of failure, or what kind of customer behavior, concatenating all of that, is predictive of the churn rate. So think about this um, when I talk about the rest of the, uh, of the approaches. So obviously we're data driven, so therefore rather than saying that it's a wonderful technology and it's theoretically better, we actually tested it. So. What I'm plotting here is accuracy, so how accurate it actually is predicting the outcome versus the speed, how quick can it do that. And as you can see, variance bar is in the upper corner, so it's high accuracy and high speed. Whereas other technologies, for example, Spark ML, which is the, uh, Google's implementation, so the planet implementation of random forest, which is a different parallelization strategy, is a little bit inferior to that. And the reason for that is really that they did not have the need for wide data as we had to. So as more applications are coming that are wide data, more and more people will think about it, obviously, and therefore the technology that will come out for wide machine learning will become better. But for the time being, we're sort of the first one in the, in the game. So we worked really hard to make it scalable. And by scalable, I mean the traditional way, many more samples, which is sort of shown here by the different line, lines. So from 1,000 samples, 5,000 samples, 10,000 samples. And as you can see, it's sort of scaling sublinearly, right? So the distances between the lines is getting, getting smaller. But of course, the other dimension is the wideness of the data, right? So many more features, which is on the x-axis here. And as you can see, that is linear too, which is, you know, which we are very proud of, I have to say. And in terms of the actual money that it costs in order to interrogate a data set like that, we plotted a couple of numbers there. So if you have 
as a 10 to the power of 6 um, features. It costs you about two, $200 Australian dollars in order to analyze a data set. And if you have 50 million features that you want to analyze and 10,000 samples, it costs you $8,000. I mean, obviously, in a DevOps and continuous deployment terms, this is prohibitively expensive. But if you're thinking about data science approach, where you want to generate a hypothesis, or you want to generate insights, then this is totally feasible. So, stepping back a little bit and talking about general data patterns. So obviously, whenever you have a problem, you want to start with the, no, the business problem. And in order to solve the business problem in a data-driven approach, you want to curate the data that's actually helping you in order to generate ideas, generate hypotheses that you can then test. And usually involved in there is cleaning the data, visualizing the data in order to get a feel for it. And once you have that, you want to build a minimal viable product, as in you want to demonstrate to your bosses that whatever you build is actually predictive. So you start off with a small test case. For that, you need to scope the technology, so you need to identify whether you want to go to cloud, to which cloud provi uh, provider, which technology do you want to use, um, and build the actual prototype. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of iteration involved in there. So building um, the technology and building the prototype, and then rinse and repeat after you've seen that maybe the cloud provider that you chose wasn't the right choice, or the technology wasn't the right um, application. But eventually, you will settle down to your minimal viable product that you can show to you know, the world. And once your company accepts that, the next step, of course, is to scale this up and put it into production. And for that, you really need to test it at scale. And also, you need to provide an API endpoint. You know, an endpoint could be an API endpoint, but anything that can, that can be called for the, from the rest of the business that is not depending on your, you know, your little environment that you set up. So with that, thinking about how to actually deploy that, or how to actually make these, you know, all four steps, or you know, three steps, actually working for you, you have a couple of choices. One is to set it up on-premise, which probably is the easiest, or used to be the easiest, because you can just use your, you know, high-performance computer, in my case, or your desktop computer or service that you have sitting around, and you can use that. And it will get you basically from curating the data, doing the initial exploration, to building the minimal viral product, to some, somewhat along the line building the endpoint. Because obviously it's not, if it's on premise, it's locked in there. If that's all your company needs, then that's fine. But if it's a web application, then that is a bit of a problem. So therefore it's not going all the way to the end of the preparation of um, the production. The other option is Databricks. So I'm not sure if you have heard of Databricks, but it's a US company. And what they basically have is a Jupyter Notebook, a managed Jupyter Notebook environment that can connect with AWS and Azure resources in order for you to you know, do data science on it. And that's pretty much the extent of it. As in you can, it's wonderful for the initial data exploration, but it probably will not even get you to a minimal viral product that you can demonstrate the use case on. And it certainly is not you know, a production system that you can provide. So this is where AWS SageMaker has thought the, you know, the niche in the market of providing exactly that. So they also have the Jupyter style notebook for the initial data exploration. Obviously, you can use a whole suite of other services that they offer in order to build your minimal viable product, and then it offers a nice, easy way to package all of that up in Docker instances in order to provide the endpoint. So we are working on the last one, and next year when I come, <laughs> I can show you the, um, the, the outcome of that. But for the time being, I want to show you the Databricks demonstration case. Sorry, data breaks the data. I took my punchline away. So, we want to show you, oh, I wanted to show you something that um, I'm actually allowed to share with you. So, obviously, with 
genomic data and the privacy around genomic data, I can't just use one of my research products, uh, products and show you the results. So therefore, we came up with a nice synthetic data set in order to solve this problem and show it to you how it actually works. And this is our hipster index. So I'm sure you're familiar with the hipsters. Um, in Australia, they're very, very big, especially in Sydney, oh, which is sort of this stereotype of Usually IT workers with the texture, the beards, and um, always drinking coffee. So I'm sure you have uh, those characters here as well. So with that, building the synthetic data and demonstrating how to do feature selection on that, we did the following thing. So we said we had our hipster in mind. A hipster has you know, a monobrow has beards, um, he likes to wear tech shirts, and he drinks a lot of coffee. So we took actual locations in the genome that were demonstrated to be associated with those traits, and then put them together in a fashion that represents a complex disease, where all of these genes, genes together interact in order to make you know, the phenotype hipster. So with that, this is our hipster formula. Uh, it's very sciencey. Our hipster formula, and we took a publicly available data set which had a thousand or two thousand five hundred individuals in there. We calculated with this score which ones of those is actually a you know a, a hipster, and then we label them with zero or one being a hipster or you know, being normal. So with this notebook, it basically walks you through how to set up a variance spark run on a data set that you might have, a wide data set that you might have. So the first thing, obviously, is to load the data. And as you can see here, and I hope you can see it in the back, is that it's sitting on S3, an S3 bucket. So this is the AWS examples. Obviously, there's an Azure example as well, where it's sitting on block, block storage. So therefore, ultimately, the idea is that you can just swap in and out new data sets, and the rest of the workflow is the same. So what is the rest of the workflow? The rest of the flow workflow is to load the libraries that we have, the variance spark libraries. We load the annotation labels, which is our hipster index. So 2,000 individuals, 0, 1 annotated, whether they hipster or not. And then we actually run the analysis. So it's really as, as simple as just uh, calling a particular, sorry, just calling a one-liner for doing all of that. Now, I'm not going to go into the, um, the science behind how we actually chose which gene it is. Let's leave that for the researchers. But the other thing that I really wanted to show you is that typically in data science, when you have a data scientist, they're not coming with a standard education, right? They, they're coming from all walks of life. So therefore, they have all sorts of different computational backgrounds and languages that they prefer. And data breaks, or generally Jupyter notebooks, cater for this nicely. So for example, the, the first example that I have here is an SQL query. We'll just select the important source, which is basically how relevant a particular location is in the genome with the disease status. So is it predictive of being a hipster? So we can just collect the first 25 of these important genes and just plot it like that with you know, a little one-liner like that. Similarly, we can use Python and plot it a little bit more complicatedly, but it's sort of the same, the same concept that we're plotting the important score of all locations in the genome. Well, if R is your poison of choice, then this will be the R example for that. Obviously, for plotting, it's quite nice with GT40. So this is showing you the actual result. Sorry, something is sitting on the screen. So the actual result is that, remember, we had four locations in the genome that we synthetically associated with being a hipster. 
and variance bug indeed identifies four locations in the genome and they nicely line up, otherwise I wouldn't have shown it to you, they nicely line up with the monobrow, the fabulous hair or beard, the textured and the coffee consumptions in there. So what I'm showing here basically is the whole genome. So every, every dot here represents a genomic location, so every one of the three billion letters. And up here is the importance um, um, contribution, how this particular location is contributing to the disease status or is associated with it. And as you can see, the four locations really stand out like a sore thumb. Now, what I want to stress here, this is very you know, gene-centric or genetic-centric, but these applications, as I said, could be any other application that requires large amount of features and you want to know which one of those features is actually predicted for a certain outcome. So with that, going back to the presentation, and therefore I'm really encouraging you to um, try it out yourself. You can log into Data or you can create an account at Databricks. And this is not a plug for Databricks, but you can uh, create an account for free. You can copy this particular notebook and all you need to do is to point it to the big data set that you have and just follow the steps in there and see what comes out of it. So with that, I'm really trying to build sort of an international community around wide machine learning. And if you can solve some genetic disease along the way, all the better. So a lot of people come up to me and say, well, this is really, this is really nice. I would like to contribute to, to that as well. I want to do some genetic exploration or at least be part of the community in order to improve human health. And can I do that? I don't have a you know, science background. I'm not working at research institutes. How can I help? And the answer for me is, is yes, oh my god, your background is absolutely fantastic to help in that space. And let me give you a couple of examples where volunteers that do not have a, a life science or health science background have helped us dramatically in order to move this research forward. So for example, Lynn Langett, that you might know from being one of the largest contributors to Linda.com. She had uh, the question, well, what kind of architecture is the best architecture to really do these analysis? And is data breaks the way forward or should we set it up on AWS, so basically closer to bare metal? And what she was saying, what she was finding or doing, she was doing actually the comparison between a small cluster on Databricks, a small cluster on AWS, a large cluster in both of them, and just recording the runtime between you know, all four scenarios. And what she found is that there's not much of a difference between AWS and Databricks. So what is it for the, for the large cluster? It takes three hours for, data, for AWS and 2.7 hours for Databricks which in terms of research terms, that's nothing. But this really enabled us to clear the path in order to set up SageMaker, which is such a, such a nice, easy pathway from conception over you know, the initial analysis to an endpoint. So this demonstrating that really pivoted or you know, cleared the way for us to go there. Similarly with Deers, so Deers is a consulting company in Melbourne. And they're typically working with you know, research, but also business applications. And what they did was to take the Scala API that we implemented and ported it over to Python, which you know, for them was an easy task because this is what they're doing on a daily basis. Whereas for us, this really was a game changer because there was no way that we could have the resources in order to recreate the Scala application that we already had in Python, knowing that you know, Python probably is the preferred method for the community. So again, this was wonderful uh, help from, from the volunteers. So with that, I want to change track a little bit and go to GT Scan 2. So as I said, this is a genome engineering application. So what is genome engineering? I'm sure you've heard of CRISPR 
you know, being the revolutionizing technology or really a game changer for making edits in the genome of living organisms. And the application case, the obvious application case here, will be to cure genetic diseases. And specifically how close we actually are to this golden age of medicine was demonstrated by a paper last year where they edited out a genetic disease, in particular of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a heart disease. In Australia, I think one in 500 Australians suffer from that. And it basically is a really nasty disease. Like It makes your heart wall grow thicker and thicker, and eventually your heart just stops, and you die from it. So obviously, this is a disease you want to be aware of and ideally manage. And this might be one of the technologies that can help us do that. But the problem was that they demonstrated that it works in seven out of 10 embryos that they edited, which is fantastic. I mean, seven out of 10 um, diseases cured. But if you think of this being your unborn child, then three out of 10 failure rate is way too high. And this is the area that we want to work on. We want to make it work the first time, every time, in order to really eradicate genetic diseases that are amenable to these things. So therefore, we're coming from a computational background, obviously. Therefore, the way to improve this performance, to make it more efficient, is to increase the speed, so make it faster to actually predict the outcome, which means you can test more parameters in the same time frame. So we brought it down from, by paralyzing it, we brought it down from a couple of minutes to seconds. And by increasing the scale. Because researchers might want to search the outcome for one gene, or they might want to search the rest of the genome as well, which is 100,000 genes. So therefore, things that only take a couple of seconds, scaling that up to 1,000, 100,000 applications has not been easy in the past, especially for web applications. But with Lambda coming along and general serverless architecture, this is a match made in heaven. So as such, when we first heard about it, we really jumped at that opportunity. And we were the first serverless application that, is, that was complex enough you know, to, to cover a full research pipeline. And as such, we got a lot of attention in the international media, and it's now used in a couple of high-profile research institutions in Australia. So what is GTScan? GTScan is basically the search engine for the genome where researchers can type in the gene that they want to edit, and GTScan gives a ranked list of you know, what locations near that gene are the most optimal in order to edit that gene. Focusing the resources, thinking about embryos, focusing the researchers' resources on only the sites that actually work. And as you can see down here, so every bar is a site that the genome editing machinery could attach to and edit at. And in green are the sites that are high activity, and black are the ones that are not high activity. And just looking at it, I mean, they're right next to each other. How would a researcher know which one is the best one? So this is where GT scan really comes in. So again, giving you a quick demo. So here the application case is basically to have an interoperable and reproducible research. So rather than going in manually for the researchers to type in which gene they want to edit, I want to have this an API call that so can be called from within a Jupyter notebook. And this is exactly what I'm showing here. Now again, think about that this is it's genomic centric, but as soon as you have an API gateway involved somewhere, this application or this approach works for your, your research. And in terms of data science, this would be a fantastic application. So obviously, you want to set up a couple of libraries. We want to set up the actual application. So the actual application here is that we want to search the genome for one cell line or for one tissue, for heart tissue, and for another tissue. So therefore, rather than, as I said, calling GP scan, GT scan twice, we want to do that automatically. 
therefore we set up one application case where we want to search um, this particular cell line which is the um, neuropils and that particular cell line which is the heart. We submit that to, um, to the API gateway and we collect the IDs back. As you can see, we get two IDs back. And with that, we want to collect the actual results or the actual predictions back from GT scan, which is basically fetched in this, in this variable. And these are the results. So these are the locations that we found and the prediction accuracy with which we can um, identify the sites. So scrolling a little bit further down, this is sort of a typical visualization and data cleaning that you would do as a data scientist. But ultimately, this is sort of what we've seen um, you know, in, in the GT scan application as well. We have recreated in the API or in the Jupyter notebook with Plotlib in that, in that particular case. So again, every triangle here is a particular site, in green are the high activity, and in, red, uh, in black are the low activity sites the two cell lines that we want to interrogate. And now we want to know which one is actually different out of all the sites. And again, eyeballing that would be a bit hard, but of course it's in a notebook, so we can do it programmatically. So going through here, this is the actual result. So out of all of these sites, we find that one is actually high activity in heart, whereas um, it would be low activity in the other application or in the other tissues. And if you think of an application case where you only want to target one particular tissue but want to keep the rest of the human body intact or you know, unedited, this will be the application in order to find out which site actually to edit with high precision to a certain, um, to a certain tissue. Good. So with that, I'm jumping to the generalization of this. So, as I said, the cloud pattern that we are that we are following as data scientists is that we start off with a problem, we then find the data set that enables us to build a hypothesis and clean the data and visualize the data. Then we build a you know, a minimal viral product to interrogate that hypothesis, and if it holds, we want to scale it out to production. So for the wide machine learning application, our particular business case, what we want to define disease students. The data, obviously, is genomic data, and we're using notebooks, in that case, Jupyter notebooks, data bricks, in order to visualize data sets, and we'll be using different languages that are appropriate for interrogating the data. The minimal viable product, of course, is Varian Spark, and this is an Apache Spark application that we use on Databricks in the first place, but ultimately it will go to EMR, or AWS EMR. And the scaling out, or scaling up, will be to open it up to the research community to actually use it, particularly the Project MINE that I talked about, the Motor Neuron Disease ALS Consortium, 20,000 individuals, or 25,000 um, individuals. This is truly a scaling up problem and ultimately making it available for SageMaker as an API endpoint. With GT Scan, so the serverless application, we wanted to build a persistent but compute-intensive web service. And the alternative would have been you know, to set up a hugely expensive um, EC2 instance, for example, a server that is always on great, but it always costs, you know, it costs exactly that money for it being always on. Therefore, having a serverless architecture where you only pay for what you actually use was the, you know, the perfect match. So therefore, the genomic data was sitting on S3 on a no SQL database, DynamoDB eventually. Minimal viral product, of course, was GT scan, which uses Lambda functions and an API gateway. So the API gateway was the it basically comes along with the free interoperability through a notebook. And then the preparation for 
production and the scaling up was obviously the research community. And here we needed to build in an auto scaling approach. So the, specifically the DynamoDB database needed to scale to having one user interrogate the data set or no, dreaming big, 100,000 users. And again, SageMaker will be a perfect match here as well. Good, with that, overall, the three things to remember or that I want you to remember from this talk is datafication will come and will make every single data set, including the data sets you're working with, much wider, so many more features. Therefore, this is a true, in my mind, a true paradigm shift for machine learning applications that are catering for wide data, not only deep data. Serverless architecture, on the other hand, is catering or can cater for compute-intensive tasks, even though it was originally invented for you know, little tasks like converting speech to text. By setting up an architecture that is truly you know, designed through from end to end, we can utilize serverless architecture for even compute or data-intensive tasks. And in my mind, business and life science research is not that different. Therefore, building a community together and building tools that can be used in business, but also incidentally resolve human health problems is probably a really good way to go forward. So therefore, I encourage you to have a look at the two open source technologies that we have, Varian Spark and TT Scan. And if you have time and want to volunteer, please get in touch with me. With that, thank you to our collaborators and the rest of the team, and you for listening.